The subject of today's session is confronting evil with God. That is, dealing with the challenge of evil, with, of course, the realization that we aren't going to attempt to excuse evil, ignore evil, or otherwise avoid the problem that evil presents to us by not confronting the challenge of evil with God. There's obviously an additional dimension besides what we will, God willing, discuss today, and that is confronting human suffering with God, which I realize is, on manifold planes, maybe the most important aspect of treating the subject of evil, but because of its vast scope, I think we're going to have to dedicate a separate session to confronting human suffering with God. For now, we have our work cut out for ourselves in addressing the challenge of evil. So let's begin with questions and consider where they lead us. Question number one, confronting evil with God, does evil really exist? Or is it just a figment of our imagination? If evil does exist, how can we account for its existence? Can both good and evil arise from one source? And we'll conjoin with question number one, question number two, which inevitably considers the self-same issues. If evil does not come from God, what is its source? If it comes from God, is God evil? Conversely, if God is good and opposes evil and he is omnipotent and omniscient, why does he not eliminate evil altogether? Okay, so of course, again, I'm going to reiterate, these questions may appear a bit abstract, maybe excessively philosophical. Of course, they strike at the very root of our existence, our lives in this world. It is the challenge that evil presents to us. It is a challenge, inevitably, that strikes at the very essence of our conception of the world and our conception of God. And maybe a good way of beginning is by simply considering the quandary that evil so vividly presents to us. Because as it becomes very clear in the questions that we just read, we seem to be faced with two alternatives, neither of which are especially acceptable. One alternative would be to say that evil comes from some source other than God, which has the advantage that it appear to enable us to maintain our conception of God as completely free from evil. But of course, the problem with that alternative is it demands of us pretty much doing away with our conception of God as the source, as the cause of all that is. The alternative, are we then to posit that evil originates in God? But then what does that do with our conception of God as well? In order to 
salvage our viewing God as the source of all that is, we seem to have placed ourselves in a far worse situation of ascribing evil to God. These are major problems. And it is precisely in the wake of these questions that we need to explore what is the Bible teaching us? What does it convey to us in addressing these challenges? I feel compelled to share with you at the outset an important realization that certainly in my mind, undoubtedly, is the background when we need to address these questions. And that is what emerged in particular um, among the Neo-Aristotelians, more broadly in the scheme of rationalist Greek philosophy and the Neo-Greek philosophy, the Neo-Aristotelians in the medieval period. And that was what amounted to the very challenge to believing that God could possibly be involved in what is taking place in the world, because after all, if we believe that God is completely devoid of deficiency, then he must be omnipotent, he must be all-powerful. Well, how do we explain the world looking the way it does? If God knows what's going on in the world, if he is involved in it, and he has the capacity to act, how can the world look the way it does? So they concluded that their deity was completely uninvolved in, unaware of what's taking place in the world. It is, after all, a way of resolving the problem. I'm sure it's clear to all of us that that is not an acceptable alternative for anyone who believes in the Bible or the God of the Bible. These are all problems we cannot help but address. And maybe the first point of note in addressing these questions, and it is on this note that I feel compelled to begin, is just defending the importance of asking questions like this altogether. When we confront evil, in a way, we feel ourselves in kind of similar position, perhaps, to our father Abraham. Abraham, in Genesis chapter 18, is informed by God of the impending doom of Sodom and Gomorrah. He hears from God of the impending evil that is to befall these places. And how does Abraham react to that? In chapter 18 of Genesis, in verse 23, and Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep away and not forgive the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? That be far from you to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do justly? Now, of course, inevitably we consider what is Abraham saying here? And I think we've noted this in the past in the course of our study of Genesis chapter 18 in other contexts as well, Abraham has a sense of justice. Justice is not simply defined as what God says or what God does. Abraham has that innate sense of what is just. Of course, we'll say he has it because God planted it within him. But from Abraham's perspective, he is obligated to challenge to ask the question, to seek an answer. And you know, 
perhaps more generally on the subject of asking questions, I feel compelled to share with you a little story that I heard from a good friend of mine who is a professor of philosophy here in Jerusalem, a very religious man who told me of an incident that he heard about with respect to his mentor, a professor of philosophy back in the United States. The professor, his name was Stanley Morgan Besser, was religiously sensitive. He wasn't as religious as my friend, but the story pertained to a time when Professor Morgan Besser was present in the audience when a particularly pompous professor was holding forth and telling his audience, the atheist has only questions. The theist, the one who is religious, has only answers. As if to imply that when one is religious, one no longer has any problems, one no longer has any questions. Morgan Besser leaned over to the person who was sitting next to him and said, I don't know why he in particular chose this particular personality, but he said, the Lubavitcher Rebbe has more questions in a single night than this professor will have in his entire life. I don't think it's something unique to the Lubavitcher Rebbe or any other particular religious figure. On the contrary, it says something about truly devout religious figures generally. An example that comes to my mind is Mother Teresa, whose questions so vividly came to the fore in her memoirs, her autobiographical notes that admittedly were printed against her will, but that I think reveal a profoundly religious personality who, like our father Abraham, is continuously engaged in this dialogue with God, a dialogue that is not composed of facile answers, of simple pat questions, but a dialogue that probes, that demands. An atheist can undoubtedly fight evil with all his heart, but in a very deep intellectual sense, he has no reason to be troubled, to be disturbed by the existence of evil. After all, if there is no God, why should evil be anything surprising to us? If there is no God, there is no system, there is no order. In that vein, if there is no God, there is no question. The question specifically emerges when you do believe that there is a God, when you do believe that God is good, and you look around in the world, and you ask yourself, so where is he? Whence this evil that we do see around us? How are we to confront it with God? It's all too easy to confront evil when we stand without God. And of course, inevitably, since the premise of our discussion here is we do believe in God, and we're not going to seek the easy course of denying God in order to deny the problem, there is, admittedly, the allure of saying, maybe we're not going to deny God, but maybe we should deny evil. 
Maybe evil doesn't really exist. Maybe it's just a figment of our imaginations. It's important for us to appreciate what the motivation for saying that is. But simultaneously, it is, of course, important for us to appreciate that that answer is definitely not the answer of the Bible. That evil is real is something we could defend with so many passages in the Bible that it would be a fruitless enterprise to list them all. So we'll just list one. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. I said it before you. If I said it before you, obviously, it exists. It is real. It is a choice for you to make. You choose between these alternatives. In verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life. God is practically begging us to choose life. But he's enforcing us. Again, he sets before us both life and good and death and evil. Evil is a real possibility. And maybe, just maybe, the kind of people whom the prophet Isaiah derides in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, include people who deny that evil is evil, who deny evil altogether, and maybe indeed regard it as nothing more than a figment of their imagination. I'm not going to claim that that's the only thing wrong with the people whom Isaiah derides in chapter 5, verse 20. We discussed this verse and its context in the sessions on Isaiah elsewhere. But maybe that's also included here. Evil is evil. There is something sick, pernicious, in confusing evil with good. Evil remains evil. And it is real. And of course, having then come to the realization that we aren't going to be able to escape this problem by denying evil, we return to the question, what then is its source? So admittedly, we have a number of sources that very clearly in the Bible denounce the possibility of ascribing any evil to God. Let's begin with Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 4 and 5. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he, no evil there. And verse 5, is corruption his? No. His children's is the blemish, a generation crooked and perverse. In other words, the evil comes from them, not from God. And likewise, here too, presenting an exhaustive list of biblical citations is hopeless. But just to share a couple more, in Psalm 25, verse 10, all the paths of God are mercy and truth. In Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9, God is gracious and full of compassion. God is good to all. Certainly, no evil there. And in much the same vein that in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 5, the answer to that rhetorical question is corruption is, is no, it is his children's. Likewise, in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 9, the show of their countenance does witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom, they hide it not, 
Woe unto their soul, for they have wrought evil unto themselves. They did it. That's all they're doing. Of course, they may cast the blame on God, but the blame is theirs. In Proverbs chapter 19, verse 3, the foolishness of man perverts his way, and his heart frets against God. So his heart frets against God, he blames God, but it's the foolishness of man himself that perverts his way. And perhaps most tellingly, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29, Behold, this only have I found, that God made man upright. But they have sought out many inventions, intrigues, contrivances. And of course, here again, consider the imagery in the verse. God makes man upright. So if we discern in man something other than that uprightness, the intrigues, the contrivances, whence does it come? It comes from man. They sought out many inventions, intrigues, contrivances. So, of course, at first brush, this seems to give us a clear answer to our question about evil. It can't come from God, so it must come from man. But, of course, it should be clear to all of us that this is an exercise in futility. It's really begging the question, isn't it? After all, God created man. If the evil comes from man, then indirectly it comes from God. There is no other alternative. If man owes man's existence exclusively to God, then if evil owes its existence to man, evil owes its existence to God. God is, then, the source of evil. God is the source of everything. And the truth is, this conclusion really is inescapable in the Bible. First, we should stress what the implications of the alternative would be. If we were to ascribe evil to any source other than God, it should be clear we would be dualists. That would mean that God isn't the sovereign of all that is, the source of all that is. There are two sources. We're familiar in the Far East with yin and yang, perhaps more approximately in Zoroastrianism, a source for the good and a source for evil. It certainly has the advantage of enabling us to avoid having to deal with evil as coming from God, but at the price of God no longer being God. Is there any other source? Is there anyone or anything to whom or to which we can ascribe anything other than God? We might be inclined, by mistake, to answer, what about Satan? And I think it is important for us to consider We've noted this in the past in other studies as well. How Satan, the Satan, the instigator, appears in that book of the Hebrew Bible in which he or it appears more than anywhere else, and that is the book of Job. In Job chapter 1, verse 6, Now it fell upon a day that the angels of God came to present themselves before God, and Satan came also among them. And likewise, similarly, in chapter 2, verse 1, 
Again, it fell upon a day that the angels of God came to present themselves before God, and Satan came also among them to present himself before God. Note, Satan, which is simply a transliteration of the Hebrew Satan, which means instigator, is simply part of the heavenly retinue. The angels of God who present themselves before him. Satan, the Satan, is simply one of them. Part of that heavenly host created by God that serves its master and presents itself before its master, before God. Of course, you are certainly entitled to ask, what's the need for this heavenly host? To which I'll respond, well, you know, we've discussed the subject of angels in a number of other sessions of the Ask the Rabbis a Discussion Forum series. For our purposes at present, all I'll state is God had his reasons to establish a system of indirect divine governance of the world. It's not direct, not for the most part. But it's for the most part, there is this system of angels that God has established, that God created. None of them are self-employed. They are all ministering before God. They are created by God. And they are part of the system that he has ordained. And Satan, the Satan, is simply part of that. And the truth is that this realization that Satan, that sometimes is envisioned as the source of evil, is simply part of the heavenly host, created by God and subservient to God. That realization is something that we see explicitly in Scripture. Besides the identity of Satan, of the Satan, in the book of Job, in Amos chapter 3, verse 6, shall the horn be blown in a city and the people not tremble? Shall evil befall a city and God has not done it? All the evil that befalls a city comes from God. And similarly, also as a kind of rhetorical question, in Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 37 and 38, who is he who said, and it comes to pass, when God has not commanded it? Rhetorically, out of the mouth of the Most High, do not proceed evil and good, they both come from God. Everything comes from God. So, of course, to that extent, we recognize that there is no other source. There can be no other source. Everything, both the good and the evil, come from the only source. God is God. He is the source of all that is. There is no other. But of course, that hasn't solved our problem. Remember, the dilemma here was that whichever alternative we choose, we have a problem. So granted, the alternative of regarding evil as coming from another source, we necessarily exclude. We reject it out of hand because it is tantamount to saying that God is not God. And God is God. Everything comes from him. But now we have the question, so if evil comes from God, is God evil? And maybe the most important passage in attempting to answer this question is one that appears in Isaiah chapter 45. I'm reading verses 5, 6, and 7 for context, but the focus of our attention is on verse 7. 
I am God and there is none else beside me. There is no God. I have girded you, God says through the prophet Isaiah to Cyrus, emperor of Persia in another few hundred years. I have girded you, though you have not known me. That they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am God, and there is none else. Verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am God who does all these things. Well, here we have it. About as explicitly as it could possibly be stated that God creates evil. So again, does that mean God is evil? Dr. And in order to answer this question, I need to go with you to the other side of the page, to the Hebrew. Because in order to answer this question, what we need to consider is a profound message that the prophet Isaiah communicates to us through his choice of words. Specifically, in verse 7, we should note that we encounter three different verbs. We encounter in the Hebrew, yotzel, which is translated as form, I form the light. We twice encounter the root bore, create, as in creating darkness and creating evil. And we also twice encounter the verb ose. Ose is translated here as make, I make peace. Ose appears again at the end of the verse, translated as doing. I am God who does all these things. The truth is that ose on occasion is best translated into English as do and on occasion as make. The critical point for us to appreciate here is the difference between yotzer and ose, form, do, make on the one hand, and bore, create on the other hand. What does bore, create, mean? Well, it is often helpful in explaining the meaning of words in the Bible for us to go back and seek the first place in the Bible where the word appears. In the case of bore, or in an alternative conjugation in the past tense, bara, we don't have to look very far. Bara is the second word in the Bible. Bereshit bara. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. What does bara, create, really mean here? It is instructive for us to consider that in Genesis chapter 1, we encounter bara in three verses. It's interesting because people are sometimes inclined to think that Genesis chapter 1 is all about creation. Creation only appears in three verses. The first verse we just saw, it is the opening verse of Genesis. In the beginning, God created. The second instance in which we encounter the verb is in chapter 1, verse 21. Vayivra, and God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that creeps, wherewith the waters swarmed after its kind, and every winged fowl after its kind. That's the second instance. 
And the third instance, a single verse in which the verb appears three times, is verse 27, Vaivra, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. What do these three verses have in common, and what do they tell us about the meaning of bore, of create? Admittedly, biblical commentators have different views on this subject, but perhaps the most straightforward and most readily accessible is this verb, and only this verb carries the connotation of creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing, from absolutely nothing. The unique divine act, not based upon anything that came before. So of course, in the first verse of Genesis, in the beginning God created, that is, after all, by definition, ex nihilo. There is nothing that comes before that first verse. That's creation from nothing. The second instance in which the verb appears, this was in verse 21, is the first place where the Bible describes God as creating animal life. And perhaps here too, the implicit message is, this is a unique beginning. It's not a continuation. It is not simply forming, manipulating, molding what is. Creation of life represents a critical discontinuity, a point of departure between everything that was before and that which is now. In other words, in that sense, creating life is likewise. Creation ex nihilo, from nothing. And the, first, the third place in which we encounter this verb, again, in verse 27, is God's creation of man. Once again, not creation that is to be viewed merely as a continuation. Could be that physically, the human body may be continuous with other lower forms of life, but the creation of man is creation ex nihilo. The spirit of man, the uniqueness of man, this is creation from nothing. So you'll note that in all these instances then, this root, create, bara, bore, carries that unique connotation of ex nihilo, from nothing. So far, we've made an observation. Again, it is a point of dispute among the commentators, but one that I think accords very well with the thrust of the biblical text in the first chapter of Genesis. But of course, inevitably, the question that we cannot help but ask in this regard is, what has it to do with Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7? I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am God who does all these things. Here I feel compelled to share with you a fascinating insight of one of the foremost Jewish thinkers of the medieval period, Rabbi Moses Maimonides, who lived in the 12th century. He lived till the year 1204. And in his philosophical classic, The Guide of the Perplexed, in Unit 3, Chapter 10, he makes the following observation regarding this verse. We see, after all, that in Hebrew, the meaning of bore is creating from nothing. That means that this verb has something to do with nothingness. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, it's used to refer 
to creating something from nothing. Creation ex nihilo. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, it's used to refer to creating a nothing, an absence rather than a presence. Just consider the first part of the verse. I form the light and create darkness. Well, I understand what it means to form light. After all, after the act of formation takes place, light exists. Before that, light did not exist. What in the world could possibly be meant by creating darkness? Darkness isn't something you can create. Darkness isn't a presence. Darkness isn't an affirmation. Darkness is an absence. An absence of light. And says Rabbi Moses Maimonides, that's exactly the point. The verb create is used here to refer to something that is a nothingness, that is an absence. So if you ask, how are we to understand this first part of the verse? I form the light, and by virtue of having formed the light, I have established a world that encompasses the possibility of absence of light. So when I form the light, I create darkness. Not as an affirmative act of creation, on the contrary, as the allowance for an absence. Of course, in this vein, we continue. I make peace and create evil. Here again, peace we can certainly construe as an affirmation, completeness. Evil isn't affirming anything. It is an absence. It is an absence because, after all, focusing again on Genesis chapter 1, all that God creates is presence. And all the presence that God creates is good. We have no further look than the first day of creation. In verse 4, and God saw the light that it was good. That's an affirmation. It is a presence that is adjudged by God, as it were, as good as enduring. And that theme of that it was good recurs over and over again in the story of creation. Unlike the word create that appears only in three verses, we encounter that it was good on six occasions in Genesis chapter 1. On the third day of creation, when God separates dry land from the seas, God saw that it was good. When he creates vegetation, God saw that it was good. On the fourth day, when God creates the luminaries, God saw that it was good. On the fifth day, after God creates the fish and the fowl, the first day of creating living things, God saw that it was good. And finally, on the sixth day, after God made the beast of the earth after its kind, the cattle after its kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground after its kind, again, God saw that it was good. That it was good is a statement that is made specifically, precisely, with respect to presence. There's a specific object. God 
gives that object not only its existence by creation, but its permanence by seeing it, that it is good. And then there's one other critical motif, a grade, as it were, that God gives creation. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. You, of course, notice that there are two critical differences between verse 31 and all of the previous verses in which we saw God's evaluation that it was good. Well, of course, in verse 31, there is the insertion of the additional very. It was very good. We never encountered very before. There's an additional difference. In all of the previous six instances, God saw that it was good, was a very well-defined it, something specific, something particular that earned this divine evaluation as being good. Is there a specific object of this evaluation of very good? No. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Everything. I feel compelled to share with you, in our tradition, this final note at the end of the sixth day of creation is seen as an allusion to all sorts of things that we would frankly identify as evil. That God saw everything that he had made encompasses suffering, retribution, even death. All things that could never have been evaluated individually as God saw that it was good. All things, however, that in the broader perspective of God saw everything that he had made will be evaluated as parts of the very good. Because that is precisely the nature of this world. And this brings us back to God creating evil. God created a world. He created a world that is indeed a world. It has a system to it. As part of that system, there are going to be components that we, from our perspective, will rate as evil. We just listed several. Suffering, retribution, death. But were it not for those components, this world wouldn't be this world. I feel compelled to share with you another Hebrew observation, and that is the Hebrew word that we use to refer to the world is olam. In biblical Hebrew, that word means eternity. It was subsequently applied to the world. But when we look at the root letters of olam, we discern something very interesting. The root letters in Hebrew, Ain Lamed Mem, for the Hebraic experts here, is a root that means hidden, concealed, just as in the vast scheme of eternity, in some sense, everything is concealed. 
in the world. We live in a realm of concealment. What really matters is hidden. God created this realm, this realm of concealment. We can't say why, because he didn't tell us. And even if he would have, we probably wouldn't have understood. But we can observe what that means. Creating a realm in which there is concealment, in which there are absences, in which there is darkness, not only light, in which there is evil, not only the completeness of peace. We should note this is an idea that is implicit in what is, in the Hebrew, quite literally, the last word in the description of the seven days of creation. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, and God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because that in it he ceased from all his work, which God well, the translation here reads, in creating had made, but literally, and this is the translation that we prefer, God had created to do. In the Hebrew, asher bara la'asot. Now, what does that mean? That God had created to do? What could possibly be meant by that last word, la'asot, to do. Everything that God created, he created to do. It's not finished yet. There are absences. Those absences are an opportunity for us to rise to the challenge that God gives us to heed his charge and become his junior partners in creation. God created the world and created it as a realm that gives us a challenge to do our share. But of course, inevitably then, everything that God created is to do to keep on doing. And that in itself means that the way God creates the world contains inherent within it absence. Absence. By a different word, is evil. So long as we persist in this world, we are caught in never-ending struggle. To compensate for the absence, the presence of the good. Just consider what we mean by evil being an absence and I can see that for the illustration, I am likewise beholden to Rabbi Moses Maimonides. In Isaiah chapter 11, beginning in verse 6, we read a beautiful, rousing description of the world of the future. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together with a little child leading them. And the cow and the bear will graze, their young ones will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like cattle. And the sucking child will play on the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the basilisk's den. A world 
peace. Do you know how we get to that world of peace? Verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of God as the waters cover the seabed. In other words, in short, a world in which there are no deficiencies. When there are no deficiencies, when that knowledge fills the earth and there's no longer an absence, then of course the presence is an end of evil. In this world, there remains evil. Maybe a very simple illustration will be helpful here. So to use a simple illustration, consider, if you will, termites. Termites are small insects that colonize wood. Now, I have to admit that here in Israel, we don't have too many homes that are made of wood. So termites aren't so much of an issue here. But in those parts of the world in which homes are made of wood, termites are a major issue. I remember once reading a statement that there are only two kinds of houses that are built of wood, the houses that are infested, infested with termites, and the houses that will be infested with termites, one or the other. So, of course, from the perspective of the homeowner, termites are a terrible evil. They're destroying his home. There could be nothing left. Walls collapse. Floors give way. What could be a greater evil? And yet, it is instructive for us to consider the example of termites because it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say if there were no termites, we wouldn't exist either. There would be no human beings. That is, termites obviously don't only devour people's homes, they devour wood. In the forests, when a tree falls, a tree dies, it is most critically the termites who will devour the tree and ultimately get the process underway that restores the tree to the elements and whatever is stored up within the wood of the tree to the environment to nourish the next generation of trees. If there were no termites, then within the space of just a few years, a tree generation, forests would become graveyards of dead trees. Without termites, those dead trees wouldn't decompose, certainly not fast enough, to be able to provide the means for nourishing the next generation of trees. The dead lumber would choke off the soil, the forest would die, and eventually, so would we. We need forests to survive. So we need termites to survive. That is, again, an absence that if we were to view exclusively in its own terms, especially from the vantage point of the homeowner, appears evil. But when we put it into the larger picture, we see, just as we noted in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Part of that very good is the broader picture that enables us to see how everything is part of this extraordinary scheme established by God. So, having come to this realization, returning to our questions, 
again, when we, in question number one, ask, does evil really exist or is it just a figment of our imagination? Unequivocally, our response is, evil exists. It's a challenge that we need to face. But what is the nature of that challenge? When we ask, how can we account for its existence? Can both good and evil arise from one source? The answer, only good is a presence. Evil is an absence, just like light and darkness arise from one source. There is only one source. So evil does come from God, but it doesn't make God evil. It simply is the realization that God is the author of the world that we know. So when we ask, if God is good and opposes evil and he is omnipotent and omniscient, why does he not eliminate evil altogether? If God were to eliminate evil altogether, that would necessarily entail eliminating this world altogether. There could be other types of worlds. And indeed, ultimately, we believe in the world to come, in everlasting life, there is no evil. But that's not this world. That's not the challenge that God gave us. That is not, in a word, Olam. The realm of hiddenness, the realm of concealment, the realm that God gives us as our challenge in this world. In this world, God doesn't eliminate evil altogether. Because in this world, living as we do in a world that is continuously regenerating, regenerating and degenerating. Absence is a critical, indispensable component of their being a presence. Now, having stated this, we'll touch briefly on question three. If God is good and evil is the opposite, why does God appear to use it or allow it in specific circumstances? At this point, I think the answer is clear. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It means, ironically, that when you see the whole picture, what we call evil, and should better call absence, deficiency, is a critical component of that picture, that vast tapestry, all that God had made, that was very good. And finally, does God's use of an allowance for evil mean that people can also use it in specific circumstances? Which is admittedly a very complex question. We won't go into too many details because it would take us too far afield. What we will certainly note here is that we are indeed summoned to use that aspect of absence in fulfilling our mission in the world. We've noted this in the past, but it certainly bears stressing once again. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 8, Reading the verse literally, we read, when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet, a railing for your roof, and you shall not bring a liability of blood upon your house if the faller, or when the faller, falls from it. The literal text, the faller falls. The faller falls. He didn't fall yet. We have an ancient tradition. He is called the faller. Because God, about whom we read in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4, he who called the generations from the beginning, God, 
knows he has been designated, this person, to be a faller. But don't be the instrument of that fool yourself. God created this world, this olam, this realm of concealment with its challenges. And he gave you the choice. Remember, I placed before you this day life and the good, and death and evil. It's up to you to choose. And everything that God gives us provides the ingredients of that choosing. There is a divine plan. In Proverbs chapter 26, verse 10, granted this verse is amenable to a number of different translations, interpretations. The one we'll prefer is, great is he who performs all. We know who that is. And he hires the fool and he hires transgressors. God hires everyone. And we come into this vast drama with whatever we choose. We can choose, irrespective of whether God designated that the fuller should fall, to be the instrument of bringing a liability of blood into the world. God designated that that man was going to fall. He didn't designate for any of us to be the instrument of that fall. Harnessing free will means, on the one hand, we can choose, if we so desire, to be a cause of liability in the world. And when we do, we'll be successful. We'll be bringing liability into the world. We will be contributing, if you will, to the drama that God ordained, but as agents of evil in bringing more absence, more deficiency, more death into the world. And alternatively, we can choose to be the instruments of merit and bring merit into the world. So God hires the fool and he hires transgressors, but he can also hire us in allying ourselves with his will to do what is right. We've noted this in the past in the book of Esther in chapter 4, verse 14. Mordechai says to Queen Esther, when she has the opportunity to intercede on behalf of her people with the king, if you hold your peace at this time, relief and deliverance will arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will be lost. Who knows whether you are come to royal estate for such a time as this. You have an opportunity. You have an opportunity because, ironically, you live in a world with absences, with deficiencies, a world that remains incomplete, a world in which Everything that God created, he created to do, to keep on doing. A world that imposes upon us the opportunity and consequent responsibility to become God's junior partners. A world in which we have no choice other than to confront absence, deficiency, evil. It's real. 
And God has given us a world to struggle with that reality and to make the world better. When we confront evil with God, not by turning our backs on God, we are making the world a better place. The questions don't disappear. But the most important answer is the answer that we actualize through the choices that we make to make ourselves worthy of God's blessings. God bless you.